Hi everyone. In this video I wish to talk about gestures in Slavic spiritual practice. I've already made a spindle video before and to continue the use of our hands and tools I want to talk about gestures. And just to remind that this is magpie at magpie's corner and uh, this is a channel that is devoted to Slavic spiritual practice and sometimes culture. So to talk about gestures, gestures are something that makes our verbal speech more expressive and sometimes even easier to understand. An actor who uses no gestures while on stage simply recites his lines without expressing his feelings. Gestures are simple to produce and understand, and often they are being overlooked in verbal communication. In Slavic ritual magic, uh, use of gestures is very important. Without an appropriate action, a spell is incomplete. A modern definition of a magical act is an expression of one's self into words and charms. It is ritual gestures, Slavic chary or uh, Polish chary. I already wrote once about how to recite spells correctly. I may have even written before about what constitutes one's self and today I wish to tell you about some gestures that traditionally accompany Slavic incantations. All gestures used in Northern Slavic tradition, that's the tradition I'm most close to, may be roughly divided into three groups. First one is protective gestures. Second one is contact gestures of power. And third is contactless gestures of power. First, we'll talk about protective gestures. Protective gestures may become gestures of an attack or protection, depending on the way they're facing. Such gestures include the famous goat's head, like this. If you face your index finger there towards, uh, not index finger, your thumb, sorry, towards the enemy, that would be the gesture of an attack. And like this, this is a gesture of protection. Then there's a fig, but not ordinary fig like this, but a fig placed between your ring finger and your middle finger and facing down like this, along your body, your arms straight along your body. For example, if your boss is yelling at you, and you're feeling that it's about to get to you, you can fold that fig and face it towards the ground and kind of send all the negativity that is being poured upon you straight into the ground without letting it hurt you. Then there is a cross made with two fingers. It's also a protective gesture. Again, this gesture could be used both for attack and protection, depending on the which side uh, the fingers are facing. This is for protection. Then there is contact gestures of directing one's will, or contact gestures of power. Uh, these gestures usually require touching the object of incantation. And therefore, they're commonly used in healing, when working with a person, the ailing person. Examples of contact power gestures include straight crosses and counterclockwise circles made with a hot ring finger. For this, you envision your finger being hot and you trace counterclockwise circles like this. Again, to you they may look clockwise, for me they're counterclockwise. This gesture is used to remove a jinx. So straight crosses and counterclockwise uh, circles. Then there could be done straight crosses with the middle finger 
And I'm not trying to be impolite here, I'm just showing that middle finger is also used in uh, Slavic healing and it is used to reduce inflammation. For this we, en we envision the middle finger being cold and dry and we make straight circles upon the inflammation. Uh, then there's a pointing and tracing circles in the clockwise direction with the index finger with the ritual for gaining something and pointing and tracing circles in the counterclockwise direction with the index finger in a banishing rituals. Finally, there is a slap on the back of the head at the end of the ritual. Uh, the cunning woman recites the incantation over the ailing person and in order to help them to exit the trance that they often go into during the incantation, at the end of incantation, the words so mode it be, she slaps the person on the back of the head so they would wake up. Then there's contactless gestures of directing one's will or contactless gestures of power that do not involve physical contact with the object of incantation for their purposes to establish contact with the spiritual world. In Eastern Slavic terminology, that would be the world of Prav and the world of Nav, the world up above and the world down below, the world of the dead. Uh, some of the power gestures in this group would be lifting the hot index finger up and then pointing, usually at... Uh, the amulet, talisman, whatever you're trying to bewitch there. Uh, then there would be pushing gestures with your, with your palms during the divination rituals and certain incantations you may try to push your question or your words through into other worlds where they could be heard. Then there could be tracing circles with your hands, fingers, or your body spinning, as well as actions with ritual objects such as candles, salt, beeswax, thread, herbs, etc. Gestures play an important part when working with the elements. Each element, when opening and closing the sacred circle, is greeted with an appropriate gesture. For example, a palm flat parallel to the ground and as if patting the earth is a greeting gesture for element earth. A cupped hand that makes this counterclockwise circles is a greeting to the element water. A hand clenched into a fist as of trying to catch wind with your hand greets element air. And finally palm facing forward with fingers spread out as if warming hands by a bonfire invokes elemental fire. Sealing charms, so-called chaga zakrepa, constitute a special group. Upon finishing the incantation it is essential to release all the energy built up when reciting the magic words and then stop the energy flow, thus making the spell complete. The most classic way to end an incantation is to clap your hands on the words so mote it be, like this, so mote it be. This method does not require any additional instruments, which is why it is the most common. If a spell is cast upon a solid object instead of a clap on the hands, it makes sense to slightly slap the object, releasing all of the accumulated energy into it. So, uh, when tying a magical knot, the last tying of a thread is complete with words The knot is tied. So mode it be. Some cleansing and protective rituals involve use of arrows in the spell. At the end of the incantation, the arrows are broken, signifying the fact that the hex had been removed. Actually, some Slavic sorcerers are using arrows to cast a hex upon someone. They symbolically shoot or throw these arrows in the direction of the victim's house. So breaking the arrows uh, symbolizes breaking of the hex in the counterspell. Uh, for arrows, 
normally from what I've seen just sticks they might be a little pointy or sharpened but not actual arrows but just uh, sticks are used and they're broken in the end of the incantation to remove a hex during the transfer of an illness upon the object at the end of the incantation the object to which the illness had been transferred to may be thrown into the flowing water, typically a river. So they would take a rock and try to transfer an illness on and so that it would stay there and the illness would not come out. They throw this rock into the flowing water that is believed to carry their illness all the way into the other world. Those working with a staff tap it or even stick it in the ground once done reciting the incantation. This method could be found in fairy tales and their corresponding screenplays. A similar gesture may be performed with a shorter wand, like this. One more way to seal a spell is to have a padlock nearby, specially purchased for that purpose. And with the words, so mote it be, lock it shut. This padlock is ritually disposed of later, buried, hidden under a rock, or more commonly thrown in the flowing water. Dupl Due to pollution issues, I would not recommend the latter. I do not like our water bodies being polluted. However, it is still an effective traditional way to seal an incantation that is even mentioned within traditional Russian incantations. And I seal my spell with 12 golden keys and I cast 12 golden... Uh, <clears throat> sorry. And I seal my spell with 12 golden locks and I cast 12 golden keys in the blue ocean sea under a white rock. Key in the sea, lock in the mouth. As important as gestures are in Slavic ceremonial magic, any gesture would be pointless when it does not absorb the will of the practitioner within. Without oneself expressed in his or her words and gestures, magical action cannot be complete or even started for that matter. For with our instruments or without them, with all the words correct or incorrect, if there is no will and knowledge how to express this will through words and charms, magical ritual remains just a pretend wizard game. Sorry for being so harsh, but let's face the truth. So this is what I wanted to tell you today and thank you for watching. Blessed be.